Welcome everybody. I'm Fiona Chambers and I'm the CEO of the Wean V Foundation. Um, and we, look, we're really delighted to be one of the sponsors of the uh, Discover Bees Through Photography webinar this evening. So welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the the um, custodians of the land where I'm coming from today. I'm coming from Southwest Victoria, which is Goolagin country. So I pay my respects to the elders, um, past, present and emerging. And I would encourage each of you um, on the call today to uh, write in the chat function where you're coming, where you're joining us from today, because I know we've got people from all over Australia. So it'd be great if you would just throw down in the chat whereabouts it is you're coming from. So welcome, everybody. It's a really exciting uh, webinar this evening. We have um, uh, we're going to be celebrating photography and uh, pollinators and pollinators in photography. Uh, and I'm delighted to say we've had over 500 entries to the photographic competition. Uh, we've got three we've got three judges who are going to be joining us and sharing uh, some of their favorite photos uh, and talking about what they've learned about photography. Uh, we've got seven sponsors and we've got eight category of prizes that we're going to be announcing at the end of this webinar. So there's a lot happening. Uh, we have this, with us this evening uh, Michael Duncan. Michael is a researcher with uh, Western Sydney University and he's uh, a keen photographer and particularly in macro and is very involved with the research of both honeybees and native bees. And I know um, Michael's doing quite a bit of work at the moment with uh, Blue Banded Bee Research. And I and Michael is a, a very dear friend of our benefactor, Gretchen Ween. So it's nice to have you here today, Michael. Um, we've also got Anna Karukin. Anna is a beekeeper and a botanist um, and is currently the editor of ABK magazine um, and spent some time working with Ween Bee Foundation on various projects. Uh, so another keen photographer um, doing all sorts of photographic work comes with great experience to, to be judging today. And finally, we've got Bruce Malcolm, who um, is uh, claims to be self-taught, but I have to say last year when we uh, ran the photographic competition, Bruce managed to somehow get five uh, uh, five of his photographs in the top 10 didn't quite nail the, the top prize but he had so many in that in that top 10 so I was really delighted to invite uh, Bruce to judge this year um, uh, judge is from originally from Walgett I think is that right it's now in Narrabri so uh, we've got a really good spread of people then so Anna's in Victoria Bruce is um, New South Wales and Michael's New South Wales too so welcome all of you um, now, our first speaker, the first uh, person we're going to have share some information on photographs tonight is going to be Michael, and then we'll hear from Bruce, and then finally Anna. So if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A, and we'll make sure we have a Q&A at the end, so you'll have an opportunity to ask you specific questions of any of the speakers as well. Over to you, Michael. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. So as it was pointed out, I'm um, a scientific researcher at Western Sydney University, and I work with bees in my private time with spiders and snakes. So all the stuff people, you know, usually love to hate, but, you know, it's it's my passion. Um, so what makes a good shot in photography? Well, that's open to interpretation and everyone has their own idea. So we don't worry about that too much. Um, and, you know, what, what is the best gear for taking photos? I often get asked that question. The best gear is the camera you've got in your hand, whether that be a mobile phone, doesn't matter what type of camera, you just learn how to use that camera, learn how to compose an image and learn how to use that gear to the best of your ability. The images that I'm shooting with um, or showing you here are shot with uh, a Canon 1DX Mark II, an MT24 twin flash unit, an MPE 65 5 to 1 macro lens and a Godox Pro Pack battery pack to keep the flash firing at a million miles an hour. Now that sounds like fancy gear and everything, and it is, and it's expensive gear, but you don't require that to take a good shot. It's just a passion I have, and to get the detail that I want, as the scientist I am, every hair, everything possible, that's the type of gear I use. So moving on to this first photo, it's actually a peacock spider in dance phase. So if you've ever seen these guys dance on YouTube, you'll see that 
they dance away quite rapidly, move, waving their arms and legs. Now, this photo is actually shot with a female in the foreground making the male dance. And this is at the pause stage of its dance. Now, they only pause for five seconds. And this image is then composed of 13 uh, stacked, fo focus stacked images. So what that means is I'm taking 13 individual shots at a different focal plane of the spider and then stacking those photos all together to create an image. Often it will take me 700 images to actually get the photo that I want. So there's a lot of work that goes into composing uh, such a photo with this level of detail. Just to put this into perspective, this is a three millimeter peacock spider. So I have to be ready to go. I have to know this spider's behavior and to execute this shot, I need to have my gear perfectly ready at the right settings and then I have to move into the plane with that five seconds that I have while it pauses in its dance phase and breathe in and move in very gently, millimeter by millimeter, firing the camera flash at 14 frames a second, hence the battery pack, and then be able to stack those images together. So that sounds like a lot of work and that's what it takes to get an image of that detail of something so small. The lens has a focal plane like as thin as a piece of paper. So you need to stack many images together to get that high level of detail. So moving on, just to show you in size perspective, this is a single shot I took. This shows that, you know, a single shot can still have just as much impact. This is my most followed photo online. It almost went viral. This is a peacock spider on a match head. This actually shows you the size um, of the spider. That one's about one and a half to two millimetres in size. And obviously I had to get it to run to the top of the matchstick. The matchstick's held there with a the blue tack. We, you know, we, we've all staged an image before. Um, but to get that shot, it speaks for itself. It tells a story. I was asked to actually show, take a photo to actually explain the size of these peacock spiders. And I thought this one did it really well. So this is just a, a single shot um, with a good light control. Uh, it's, I think it's an F14 from memory. So um, to get the depth of field. Um, but yeah, I think it, it speaks for itself. Uh, the next photo, this is again a highly detailed stacked uh, photograph of a peacock spider eating a plant hopper. Now, in this particular stage, what I want to get across to you is that you take opportunities of things with spiders. The other spider dancing, I had to anticipate when its uh, dance phase was going to pause. But this particular spider, it's just feeding away. So it's nice and stationary, still standing there. So I've got all the time in the world. That might only be 40 seconds before it moves, but plenty of time to make sure my lighting's correct. And this is where you know light diffusion comes in really well. I had really good lighting control over this particular image. The better you diffuse your light, that that can be something as simple as um, you know the plastic diffusers you buy for your flash, or in this particular case, I have a winged diffuser with a piece of polystyrene foam, which softens the light, which helps bring out the details in the hair and on the plant hopper. So you know, there are different techniques to try. I've thrown a fourth one in there. This is an opportunistic snot, uh, shot. This is a venomous snake called a broad-headed snake local to the Blue Mountains. This is actually shot with a Canon 70D with a diopter, um, a Raynox DCR250, just clipped to the end of my macro lens. So a standard 50 mil macro with the diopter, which magnifies that lens two and a half times. That's a cheap option to get a really good macro lens. It just clips to the front of the lens, magnifies that lens two and a half times. Now I was focusing on the eye and the head. The mouth was actually closed, just trying to get a really detailed shot. And the snake just happened to open its mouth and flip its tongue. And that would be a venom droplet on, on its tongue there. Now, it's not a focus stack shot or otherwise, you know, more of it would be in, um, in focus of the tongue. But I did nail the uh, the detail around the head and just I think the uh, snake flicking its tongue adds sort of movement to the image. So, yeah, that's the photos in a nutshell. I guess the take-home tips that I would, would say to you that I've learned is know your subject, 
um, its behavior, anticipate its movements, uh, and be ready to nail that shot. So knowing everything about where it's going to move. So whether that's a flying bee, you're watching it go from flower to flower to flower, up a salvia stalk, for example, um, and anticipate where the next flower is it's going to land and be ready to nail that shot. So knowing your subject, uh, knowing your gear, having all your settings, lighting, your light controlled, your batteries, memory cards, everything all ready to go. You don't want that to muck up while you're trying to get that action shot. Post-production is something that people are scared of. So being able to see an image within the image you've taken, maybe crop uh, to enhance uh, the composition of that photo, um, even to get more detail, cloning out distractions or spots, sensor spots on your camera or distractions in the image. So if there's an unwanted fly that flew into the image, you can actually clone those things out. It's not cheating with a photograph, it's just the software and tools that are available today. And, you know, to, to put it into perspective on some of those peacock spiders, I'll blow the image up to 100% and I'll clone in and around the hairs because you get this ghosting effect with focus stacking to increase the sharpness and detail of an image. Um, and then finally, don't be afraid to try things. Think outside the box and test the limits of your gear and then even go further than that. There's no rules to this stuff. I've been, you know, changing my gear by putting a Band-Aid over one of the trigger pins on the flash to stop it build, uh, to stop the heat sink building up just so I can fire that flash more times. So don't be, a, don't be scared to experiment with gear. You could be a pioneer, you know, taking the, the, the next big shot uh, just by trying things. And uh, thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Michael. And, um, you know, thanks really very much for showing us spiders and snakes. We've just lost half the audience, all the people who are ar arachnophobic and, and, and terrified of snakes. They've just left. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> they were amazing photos. Uh, one question I have to ask is how poisonous was that snake? Is it venomous? Yeah, they're highly venomous. Um, unfortunately, they're mistaken often for diamond pythons in the Blue Mountains, and there's been a few bites from people playing with what they perceive to be a harmless diamond python. Um, not recorded deaths, but, yeah, they can make you pretty sick. Um, so, yeah, it's not... How close were you? How close were you to take that? So the Rhinox diopter works at about a two-and-a-half to three-centimetre range off, off the head of the snake. I was in a very controlled situation. Um, I had a... You had your running shoes on. <laughs> I had another person with me uh, watching the movements of the snake. So I wasn't in any danger. I felt at no stage in any danger. But I wouldn't recommend it to someone that doesn't know those <laughs> subjects well. <laughs> Disclaimer, when you're taking photos of snakes, and, um, of course, this is about uh, um, pollinators, so most people here wouldn't be taking photos of snakes. Thank you, Michael. That was really, really interesting. So we'll hear from Bruce now. So um, you haven't got too many snakes and spiders. I've got no snakes, but I might have the odd wasp there somewhere. Well, my um, favourite subjects are actually bees, but every now and again, you know, something else will pop up and I've got these out of order and now I'm showing a wasp first. But what I try to do with bees is get them flying if I can and generally towards me because um, that gives a good perspective. But if I can't get that, I try to get the bees doing something unusual or striking an unusual pose. And um, I'll come to that a little bit later. But this particular time, I was trying to shoot bees coming to a bird bath when this uh, wasp appeared and I just managed to fluke this flying shot. I'll go on. This is um, obviously a flying bee. And I like this shot because right in the end of its proboscis there, it's got a stick or something. Uh, followed by my one of my favourite action shots, which I think you've seen before, is this flying bee. It also has got a couple of little funny things there, including a little bit of movement. But, um, yeah, I was really happy with that shot. I'll just run through a few and then I'll tell you what my camera settings are. Oh, this is an interesting one. I was shooting, um, trying to shoot resin bees. And this one, which I think is a um, Mega Kylie Orophons, but I'm not 100% sure. And while I was attempting to shoot them in a different position, this one landed on my leg and started licking the salt in my perspiration. So I swung around and I, I just managed to flip this one shot. But, um, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. It's a bit unusual. And it's got a very long tongue. 
this is also a bit of a happy accident. I was also shooting bees that are trying to shoot bees at a different bird bath when this fly, which I think is called a uh, flesh fly, just appeared out of nowhere. I, it wasn't actually in the place I would have liked it, but there it is. So I managed to get this shot. Um, and to get this low angle, which I like to do if I can, because it gives you a much more dramatic perspective, I had the uh, bottom part of the lens sort of actually in the water of the bird bath. That fly, I think, is called a flesh fly, and I believe it's got terrible eating habits. This is just a sort of a bit of an unusual angle of a bee going for nectar. They're the sort of things I try to get, something just a little bit unusual. I like this one because it's rather an unusual uh, composition. I like this one because it's fully backlit and it shows the translucent quality of the bee's body. I thought that was quite interesting. This is a resin bee taking its propolis or might be propolis, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, into its uh, hull. And uh, this one is a praying mantis just peering over a, I'm not sure of the name of the flower, but I had a very low angle there to give a little bit of drama. My equipment is a 90 millimeter camera macro lens, which I bought about two years ago when I started macro. In hindsight, it's just a little bit too short. I'd like something a bit longer, say 100 millimeter or even a little bit longer than that. So I have the um, Canon R7 camera at the moment, which has an APS-C uh, sensor, which is a little bit smaller than the full frame. And that gives me a little bit more working distance. Usually for shots like this, I'd be up around, say, 150 millimetres or somewhere between 100 and 200 millimetres. I have to get in quite close. I always try to shoot backlit, but sometimes it doesn't turn out and sometimes it's difficult. The backlight gives better definition to the um, hair and all sorts of things. I always use flash. That makes the job a heck of a lot easier. And like Michael, I have a diffuser, a, a homemade one, right at the front of the lens. And uh, what I actually use as the diffusion material is simple kitchen paper out of the uh, kitchen pantry. Works like a charm. The trick is when you're trying to shoot these shots outside with a flash is to sort of balance it with the daylight. And that's a little bit tricky and, until you get used to it. I also shoot at a high frame rate. I shoot at 15 frames per second. And the reason I do that, when I take these pictures, I don't wait until the bee actually does something before I press the button, because if I do that, there won't even be a bee in the picture. I've got hundreds of pictures when there's nothing in the frame at all, the bee's gone. So what I do is I, I try to anticipate their movement. I try to figure out what they're going to do next. And I press the button when I think they're going to do something, which I might add doesn't work out a lot of the time. But to shoot at that high frame rate, by the way, with a flash, you have to keep the flash power down quite low because it won't recycle quick enough. While I'm shooting at 15 frames per second, I generally only get about three or four actual exposures. I don't hold my finger down for the whole 15. It just won't happen. But three or four is enough to every now and again come up with a good picture. The other thing I'd like to say too, when you're trying to take a shot like this, don't go out and take a couple of shots and you don't get it and you think, oh, this is too difficult. When I go out shooting these sort of pictures, I wouldn't even attempt to do it under 300 shots. And even then you may not, probably won't get a shot like this or that or that. But if I shoot 300, I might flip something like that. But to get that one, I might have to take multi hundreds, maybe a thousand shots. Because what I do for these ones, I basically guess where their flying track is going to be. Say, for instance, they might all be heading for a particular flower, or maybe you can put in a bit of a lure there, like say sugar water in a place, and you might get a lot of bees flying around. So I guess where I think they might be flying, and I watch very carefully. And when some come, uh, a bee or an insect comes anywhere near that particular spot, I press the button and fire off some shots. But as you can see, it's hit and miss, and it's basically a guess. And as uh, Michael was say, saying earlier, the depth of field in macro photography is pretty small. But I don't generally get as close as um, Michael. I keep back a little bit, so that gives me a little bit more depth of field. And actually talking about depth of field, for any new chums, my advice is to keep back a little bit. Don't try to shoot at one to one, or even say one to two. Move back a little bit, as that is easier for you to track the bee, easier to make focus. 
you can crop the image in post-processing and still get a reasonable shot. Now, if you're only going to put your pictures on, say, social media or show your friends, you can crop in a long way before it reduces the quality. When you're trying to focus these shots, don't try to use um, autofocus and don't actually try to get up near the subject and try turning your focus ring. This is a very, almost an impossible way to do it. The, the trick is preset your focus before you go out there, say about somewhere around about 150 millimeters or maybe 200. And when you get out there, move your camera roughly that away from your subject and then gently rock backwards and forwards until you get your focus correctly. And it's always best to focus on the eye. So rock in and out until that focus looks good, hit the button. Oh, by the way, these sort of shots take a lot of pictures too, hundreds, because you have to guess where this bee is going to be. And they don't actually fly a straight line into that hole. Take that one, for instance. I tried to get an unusual angle, so I shot from the top, but notice how it's not in a straight line for that hole. So in this case, it didn't make much difference because I was at the top. Had I been shooting from the side, you can see the problem. Had I focused somewhere here because the bee is actually over here. So the trick is take a lot of pictures. Don't be afraid to take 300. Take 1,000 if you have to, and eventually you'll come up with something. And that's basically, I think, all I have at the moment. No, no, that's fantastic, Bruce. That's, that photo is incredible. It looks like it's about to get a headache. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. It does look like it's going to hit that, doesn't it? How about, how about this one? Yeah. Very similar. Yeah. But actually, she's aligned up with the hull. Oh, this one, by the way, is very interesting because that is a wasp entrance. And I was actually waiting for the wasp to come out of this hole. But this um, resin bee decided to come and have a bit of a, an investigation. So I was sort of happy to get that shot. Incredible. Some other wasps, when they drink water, often regurgitate a drop like that. And uh, you can get those shots, but by the same token, you have to take plenty of images to do it. Don't be afraid if you don't get one the first try. The best time to go out is in a very hot day. The day I did this one, it was about 40 degrees Celsius, and I'd been sitting outside for a couple of hours. You do what you have to do if you're after a picture. And you'll also notice I'm down quite low. Probably didn't have the lens in the water, but I'd be getting very close. So well, i better leave it now and um, give you some more time, Fiona. Yeah, no, that's terrific, Bruce. And for someone who who says he makes a lot of mistakes, you you make some pretty awesome mistakes. There's some pretty incredible mistakes in this. <laughs> yeah, you must remember I delete the bad ones, Fiona. Yeah, no, well, I think you're underselling yourself a little bit, but it's look wonderful to see that selection of photos. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so we might ask Anna to come and join us now and share with us um, a handful of her favourite photos. And while you're getting yourself set up, Anna, and sharing your mm -hmm. screen. I'll note the the um, prize for the long distance attendee is uh, Canada. So welcome to wow. to Craig from Toronto, Canada, who's um, who's joining us for this webinar. That's amazing! Great. My goodness, episode. it's probably like one a.m. in Canada at the moment. Don't know. Perhaps Craig can tell us what time it is. But um, that's a great effort. <laughs> 3:28 a.m. There you go. Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Let's I hope you're enjoying the presentation. Um, before I share my screen, I'll just give you a little bit of background about my, I suppose, um, interest and uh, how I got got into photography. And I'm by no means a professional. Um, a bit like Bruce, self-taught, and um, I probably have a slightly different um, approach and philosophy to what you've seen so far in this presentation. But to give you some background, I work as a beekeeper um, and editor at the moment, but I have a background in botanical research, having done a PhD in um, an area of research and floral development and spent many, many hours doing scanning electron microscopy photography as part of my research. And I would show you some of that in this presentation, but it was all on film, so there's no um, digital copies of it unless I scan them. However, um, I suppose I got the bug, pardon the pun, for photography at a young age. Um, my dad worked um, a sort of a second job hobby as a wedding photographer on weekends and had a lovely medium format Hasselblad film camera and an SLR film camera that I 
was given a role of 12 shot film and allowed to go and take some photographs and see how it works. So after a crash course in light metering, focus, um, shutter speed, aperture size, off I went and I took my first roll of film with all of 12 photos on it and I think I was a little bit hooked. My interest then um, developed further into that. Even with the advent of digital photography and more and more technology in terms of automation, my passion was still that minimalist approach and so a few years ago, I got my dream camera and I'll show you here, which you may or may not be able to see. I saved up and bought a Leica M9, which is a rangefinder camera. And it's quite different to an SLR. So when you look through, and it is digital, doesn't look it, but it is. There's the um, preview screen. When you look through the hole here, you're looking straight through. You can even see as I hold it up straight through the camera, you're not looking through the lens and you focus through what you can see through here. And so you will always have a tiny offset between what you see and what the lens is pointing at. Um, I own one lens for this camera and that is a 35 mil Zeiss lens, which is a lovely little lens and goes down to F.7. Um, and sorry, F2, and um, it's really easy to use. And like what Bruce was saying, you kind of just hone in on your subject, sort of focusing as you go, and as soon as you feel like you've got it in focus, take the shot rather than waiting for the thing to move and then nailing it is, is kind of my approach. Um, I suppose alongside owning this very minimalist camera, it does then force you to be a little bit selective in some of the photographs you take, but also perhaps a little bit more discerning because you can't rely so much on the technology. Um, so like an old school SLR camera, you've got manual um, adjustment of the shutter speed, um, you've got your aperture and focus on the lens and away you go. And then you've got a very small preview screen on the back. They do make a model for the absolute purist that has no preview screen on the back. So it's just like taking photos with film and that you don't find out what you've got until you're back at the lab, so to speak. And speaking of the lab, after I take the photographs, my post-processing um, for film, I can do black and white um, film developing. And then for digital post-processing, I use Lightroom. And I essentially just do what you would be able to do in a dark room. So some contrast, some brightness, um, you know, not really any sharpening. Um, cropping of course and that's about it and I may convert to black and white because I really enjoy black and white photography. Um, another thing I should say about this camera is I don't own a flash for this camera so when I'm shooting in low light situations I put the shutter speed down to the, the slowest um, speed that I can have and know that I can hold the camera steady, which is a 15th of a second. And it means that you've got massively underexposed photographs in low light situations, but the images contain enough information that as soon as you up the, um, the brightness or extend the exposure in um, Lightroom, the image magically appears. So, yes, the other things that um, I suppose I value and hone in on in my photography, as well as composition and colour and movement, is texture, um, which tends to come to the fore a lot more in black and white photography, and the mood, you know, the emotion of the photograph, because I don't have 
so much of a technical aspect to my photographs. I think sometimes I try and capture the mood just as much as the the um the art as well as the science, so to speak. So I will share my screen. I really, really admire the photography landscape and mainly garden photography of this incredibly talented woman called Claire Takash, spelled T-A-K-A-C-S. And if you look up her work, you'll see it's just dreamy is the only way to describe it. And this is a shot taken two kilometres up a hill from where I live at the local gardens. I'm in Western Victoria near a little town called Camperdown. And we have a botanic gardens on top of the rim of a volcanic crater. And it is just delightful. You know, turn your head. Oh, my gosh, look at that. Take the photo without thinking too much. There's almost like an X through the photograph that draws your eye to the centre. There's all these leading lines from the pointing sort of waving heads of the ornamental garlic through to the um, angled canopy of the trees and just that golden light. And I think I had a Claire Takash moment when I took that photograph and I'm not saying it's anything technically amazing. It was just one of those things where you see it, it feels good in the moment and you take the shot and maybe or maybe not it looks acceptable. This one was some photographs that I took for a friend's significant family gathering birthday celebration a couple of years ago in a local pub. And so the setting wasn't anything special and the lighting was appalling. If you'd seen this before I lightened the photograph, it just looked almost black. So again, I was just taking it, focusing um, the slowest shutter speed that I could hold the camera steady and then bringing out the brightness later on on the computer, just hoping that the, the face and the eyes are in focus and if they weren't, obviously discarding the photograph, but it was just that sort of twinkle in the eye kind of photo, little elements of sparkle from the, the glassware on the bar and then having a nicely blurred background that didn't interfere too much with the, um, the subject matter. You know, if you look really closely, there's things that you go, oh, I wish that wasn't there, like the telephone on the bar. You know, you can't pick and choose when you're just seizing the moment. And then I don't mind a little bit of street photography. I quite like geometry and shape and form and colour. And this was a laneway in Melbourne that is um, famed for being a legal place to do graffiti. And you could smell the fumes as you walk past the laneway from the paint. <laughs> There's this kid doing doing a bit of artwork and so literally as I was walking past I just lifted the camera and took the shot cropped it later because the composition wasn't great and in an ideal world you know his bag wouldn't be in the foreground because that detracts I feel from the image and you can see that it's more his elbow in focus than his face but it was just an opportunistic shot that I saw and and took the chance again on the the black and white theme and that concept of, of texture, not only of contrast. Another laneway in Melbourne and just that lovely contrast of colour and texture, like the, the white bike against the dark bricks and then you've got the rough cast brickwork versus the smooth asphalt of the laneway and then a little bit of visual interest with the installation, art installation work on the corner of the wall. In terms of composition, just having that line that leads you from your first point of focus, which is the bike and the window box, sort of up through the photograph, up the laneway towards the graffiti at the end there. This photograph is probably more about mood than technical brilliance. And this is a canal in Kyoto in Japan. At the end of the day, we've got that beautiful golden light, it's cherry blossom season. And you've just stopped and there's that serenity of the water, a subtle reflection and the, the blue-grey behind the golden pink colours. And I always find it pleasing to have diagonal lines in photographs um, rather than horizontal lines. And I just thought that that created that lovely, serene, kind of peaceful. This is just an example of one of the things I love about black and white photography is 
that it really is a great way to showcase texture. And this is an old, I think it's a workshop or a farm shed or something in Japan. And there's all this sort of weathered, aged cedar timber panelling. And then you've got the, the woven textural elements of the wicker little cart or pram. And that's casting an interesting shadow behind it onto the wood. And then a little bit of the rough cast gravel in the foreground. And even as a black and white image, it's not sort of alive and full of movement or emotion, but it has that sort of gentle subtlety that invites you just to take a closer look. And when it was in colour, it was mainly browns. You couldn't discern the texture until it was black and white. Then suddenly it all leapt out and you went, oh, wow. So don't be afraid to desaturate your images to the point of them being black and white to see what else they reveal. And this one also in Japan, again, more for the emotion than the technical aspect of the photograph. And I like this one to just give you that perspective of calm. It's a very subtle palette of colours. So, you know, you've got the very soft pinks, the sort of burnished browns, and then the silhouette of the building. So it's it's kind of nature in, in colour and the built environment in silhouette and relief, which I found a nice contrast. And this one, again, a people shot, just grabbing what you could in the moment without looking too obvious. And it is one of the things that I love about the little Leica camera is people either don't take you too seriously when you're sh taking a photo because they think you've just got a little basic film camera and I get asked all the time, is that a film camera? And they don't feel like they've got the big lens in their face. So they tend to ignore you. Um, and I like this shot because of the lighting behind on the range hood thing over here that puts this particular chef in the spotlight, so to speak, and sort of invites you, literally almost invites you into this little noodle shop. And you can almost see a haze in the light, which was probably from the fumes from the deep fryer. So it was a bit of an action shot. And um, again, one of those ones where you just take the chance, get it in focus and see what you get after you look at the photograph after you get home. Fantastic, Anna, and we might need to um, finish it on that one. If I think that's the last one, so that's all yeah. good. Terrific. Um, yeah, look, incredible, and what a, an amazing selection between yours, you know, the three photographers, and if we bring Michael and Bruce back, we've now got a bit of a sense of your photographic style and preferences, and everyone can see that there's a real variation there, which is great. Um, but perhaps we'd now just speak generally before we make the announcements of the winners of the photographic competition. What were some of the the um, the general uh, bits of feedback that you saw when you were looking at each of those five hundred plus um, uh, entries? I do have a lot of comments. There were some absolutely sensational images. Uh, none of the images were were bad images. I mean, I don't believe in bad images. It, it, and it's really hard to judge these sort of competitions because one, my gut always goes for the true macro photos because that's my style. But looking beyond that, there were some uh, sensational photos. One of the feedbacks uh, we all had is, is um, something on the composition of photos. Um, I found myself looking at a lot of sensational photos going, if only it had been cropped in from the right a little bit or lowered in from the top a little bit or the, the subject was more in focus on the eye, whatever. And they would have been some of the best shots I've ever seen. Just playing around with them on my computer screen, I was just going, wow. So I guess the take-home message that, that I had and I did in my talk was don't be afraid to muck around with your composition post-production and try and make five or six images from that one image that you like and then play around with those and just find the composition that works. You'll see it once you uh, have composed it in such a way, you'll see it and you'll go, wow, that's what the photo should look like. A lot of people are afraid to look at that post-production and, and to recompose the photo afterwards. There's nothing wrong with just shooting and hoping and then making a photo 
from the inflammation you've got. Cameras these days shoot in RAW and have so much information. Uh, as Anna was pointing out, you can bring the light back. You can bring all kinds of things back. You can actually create images from images you would normally throw in the bin. Um, and that's one thing I've learned over the times. I go back to the files and go, what if I did this or, or did that to the actual photo? And suddenly it's a whole new image. So I thought they were all sensational images. Some captured things like Anna was talking about mood, some things captured, you know, in the moment telling stories. It was very, very hard to judge them apart. And it was quite hard, I guess, for the three of us with different styles. Um, I was actually quite amazed that we did hone in on very similar pictures um, as the ones that we thought, you know, would would win this competition. So um, it was hard. Uh, you know, because every image was outstanding. Um, I had a top 10. I was happy with any of those 10 images uh, winning the competition. And it was just a matter of coming to a consensus and discussing each of those with the other judges. So well done, everyone. Uh, it was great to see all the images. Hopefully um, this builds you know, bigger and better next year. Don't be afraid to enter again and, and enter five or six photos of the same photo if you want to in different prop versions or different versions of that particular image that you think, you know, it might capture our, our eye better. Um, but, yeah, sensational work, everyone. Fantastic. Bruce, did you have any um, comments? I think you were going to have something, some crop examples. Have you got that? I have, time? but... Uh... I think um, Michael must have somehow magically got my uh, prepared speech because he basically said verbatim what I was going to say. <laughs> so um, that's the end of that. No, so, did you have some examples to share? Yeah, um, I will grab something. One of the most important things that Michael mentioned was cropping. That was the biggest problem. Now, let's see if I can share this screen. All right, well, while you're sorting that out, maybe Anna might have a couple of comments that she wants to throw in as well. Okay. Sure thing. There, there were so many standout photographs amongst the selection. Um, when you saw one that was, like Mike was saying, you know, easily top 10, you just go, right, that's going straight to the, the shortlist folder. There were some astonishingly good um, compositions and I think probably what clinched the the ranking for so many of the images that we ended up shortlisting and then ultimately choosing the winners from was the um, beautiful setting of a really clean background and then a lovely contrast between that and the subject matter and maybe the object, if it was a flower that the subject was on. Um, and also to put a bit of an anthropomorphic spin on things, often some of the ones that caught my eye, and I think we all probably felt similarly, was when the um, bug or beetle or bee or whatever was doing something perhaps a little bit cute, <laughs> almost a little bit human, like putting a front leg over a, an eye or um, just doing something a little bit engaging. And that's not to say that you go out and seek insects doing human-like things, but it you can't help but be, um, you know, a human engaging with an image and identifying with things in insects that people can identify with. So, yeah, was it an absolutely stunning array of images that we received and I, and, and I can't wait to share them to show I'm sure everyone's on the edge of their seats waiting to see the yeah. <laughs> photographs Bruce have you been able to find that yeah um, I'm, I'm fine now here we go yeah, so you just share when you're ready as um, Michael was saying one of the biggest things that I noticed in the competition was cropping there is a difference between cropping and composition but they are sort of deeply related but here I'm basically talking about cropping. Now, this image really took my eye, but the cropping sort of didn't appeal to me, but that was my take on the cropping. And to me, it makes a big difference to the result. Now, 
all rules are designed to be broken, but one of the big rules in photography is try and get your subject away from the middle and put it, the main subject towards the side here, 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 or here. Uh, the rule there, they call it the rule of thirds, but don't put your subject in the middle unless the composition app really requires it, and some images do, but a lot don't, and generally they're better to the side. So that's the starting one, that's the other one. And I thought this bee up here, while you know it's interesting being in the picture, it, it just sort of takes the eye away from this beautiful flower and this beautiful bee here. Oh, well, this one too, for instance, like the cropping there was just a little bit out and I would have went that way. And I also would have got rid of that spot there. This was a really interesting one now. I like that image because A, it's one of my favorite subjects. B, it's backlit, but the cropping was sort of a little bit too loose. So I did a few examples. Um, this one, for instance, that one, even that one, perhaps I could have nudged it slightly to the left, but who knows. This one needed a little bit of cropping. I also tried to maintain the integrity of the picture. I mean, that is just a straight out crop. Now that B is not on exactly the rule of thirds, but it's close enough because we needed to keep that in. The diagonal helps too. That's always a good way to put things. A very interesting image. There's far too much space here. It, it does actually give this butterfly room to fly into, but there's far too much. So if we go to this crop, this is quite, I like this crop, but the problem is the butterfly doesn't have anywhere to move. It's looking into the, the edge of the frame. If that butterfly had been on this flower over here, it would have been a much better image. And I perhaps I may have even cropped in closer there. But it's an image that could have been cropped quite a few ways. How about that one? Now this one, it's looking into, it's giving it somewhere to go. That's a very important consideration. And I even tried another one. When I'm cropping images, sometimes I'll make four or five different crops and I'll go back later and then decide which I like the best. That one in particular to me is just makes a big difference to that shot. And it would have put it up the scale a lot higher than it was at the time. So um, is that enough for you, Anna? Yeah, um, yep, yep, I that's mean, terrific. Um, that's okay. terrific. I think that gives a really good overview. And it was certainly something that came up again and again in the discussions as I was sitting in listening to the three judges um, reviewing their decisions. So, um, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. Okay. So I, um, now oh, someone's put a question in. Hang on, let's just see what the question is. Any tips for freezing motion of the bees while balancing natural light and flash? It's difficult. The first thing you have to do when you're trying to do that, you really have to have a good knowledge of what they sort of call the exposure triangle, you know, ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. I actually call it more like the uh, exposure pentagon or something because you've got light, you've got ambient light, you've got flash light, you've got all sorts of things. But what I do when I'm trying to shoot, my shots outside, back back little bees, I always set my shutter speed on the highest flash sync speed. Now at the moment on the R7, it's one over 320, one 320th of a second. Now the reason I set it there is because when I'm using the flash, I have to use an aperture that's sort of appropriate for keeping the flash power down because if I use a small aperture, I need a higher flash power, and that reduces the number of shots I can get due to the flash recycling slowly. And I want to get three or four shots, bang, bang, bang. And the only way you can do that is use a fairly powerful flash unit at a low power setting. I normally use it at eight, one eighth of the power, and that gives me that result. Now, when you shoot backlight, sometimes these settings might tend to very slightly overexpose the background a bit, but like it's all compromised and you can generally fix it up in post-processing. It's a very difficult challenge and you have to understand the exposure triangle or the exposure pentagon or whatever you like. You've got to balance the, the flashlight with the exposure. Now, actually one of those images I showed earlier, that flying bee uh, against the blue background, it has got a little bit of ambient exposure there where you can see streaks um, on the side of the bee. But generally, 
the um, movement doesn't show up so much if it's backlit and the exposure is not too much over for the front. Um, and the other thing, I always set the flash unit on re rear curtain sync. That actually puts the blur to the back of the movement, so it sort of looks natural. The other way, you have the blur in front of the subject, which looks unnatural. But having said that, when you're trying to shoot a flying bee and it's flitting around and you've got a camera and you're trailing it and you're going back and forth with the camera and the bee's going back and forth, sometimes the rear curtain sync doesn't work as well either. So the trick is do your best to balance that exposure. But if it's backlit, don't worry too much if maybe half a stop or one stop over. And you'll see that in the viewfinder on your little um, um, dial down the bottom. It'll show you if you're overexposed. Uh, of course, you're shooting in manual because really that's the only way to go. My exposures is almost always 200 ISO, F8 or 11, shutter speed 1 over 200, Flash power about one eighth. I use that on almost every picture you saw there tonight. Um, and I also use the fusion, as does Michael. That's very important. You can go without it with your flash, and that will enable you to use uh, less flash power, which will give you more shots and quicker recycling. But if you use the fusion, you'll get much better light. And don't use that little one that fits directly on your flash because that's not big enough. You need to make one or buy one that goes right down to the front of your lens. And you want it around about 20 centimetres across and roughly 30 centimetres high. And you can make it yourself, get some kitchen, uh, kitchen paper and spread it around a wire frame or a cardboard frame or something like that, and your pictures will improve dramatically. Thanks, okay. Bruce. We are going to need to move on because the drum roll is happening and people want to know um, who's won. So I am going to share my screen and we are going to go through the eight winners uh winning entries and the if you keep you uh, um it's eight o'clock so if the judges you can give keep your comments really really short with the review of each of these um winning entries that would be greatly appreciated the first thing i want to do is acknowledge the um seven sponsors so we're really appreciative we couldn't do it if it wasn't for our sponsors so our major sponsor for this year um, is iWooHoo, and iWooHoo is an Australian-owned and operated beekeeping equipment supplies provider. Um, they're based in Sydney, and they supply beekeeping equipment nationally. So thank you very much to iWooHoo. We've also had as a sponsor Rotarians for Bees, second year in a row. Um, Rotarians for Bees are a community of Rotary Rotarians. They're part of an Environment and Sustainability Rotarian Action Group and they aim to educate and encourage action to support bees and pollinators, um, and in particular their role in agriculture, horticulture around the world um, for food security. So that's Rotarians for Bees, thank you. Uh, Centre for Bee Education is a new sponsor. Um, Centre for Bee Education is an online learning hub that provides science-based information to school teachers and students. Uh, it's aligned with the National and Victorian curriculum and provides learning kits for teachers, which um, has a full term's worth of work, 11 lessons, using bees and pollination as a focal point for capturing students' attention. Um, and it supports the mandatory learning outcomes in a really fun and engaging way. Um, one of the partners of uh, the Centre for Bee Education is Bee School by Beechworth Honey, um, and they host school um, schools at their and provide tailored lessons at their site in Beechworth um, and their programs are developed and delivered by teachers on, on that site. So thank you to Bee School by Beechworth Honey. Um, Wean Bee Foundation of course is the charity that I work for and we're an Australian charity for bees that and we raise awareness of the importance of bees for food security, biodiversity and ecosystem health and we fund research that addresses the national and global threats to bees. Um, another sponsor is the Bee Friendly Farming Program, which is a certification program that works with farmers, gardeners, and partners to help protect, preserve, and promote pollinator health. And since launching the program in May 21, the program has certified over 50,000 hectares of farmland across six states and 13 industries and awarded more than $50,000 in funding to support the establishment of new pollinator habitat on and around farms. And the final sponsor is Nissi Filters Australia, um, who are the official Australian distributor of Nissi line of lenses, filters and camera accessories. 
and Nissi as a leading researcher and developer, developer of optical glass manufacturing techniques, has been operating since 2005 and has more than 500 products in their range with about 10 to 20 new products um, uh, to suit a range of cameras being developed every, each and every year. So thank you very much to all of those sponsors. So we're going to now drum roll move on. The first prize we're going to announce is the primary school winner, which will receive a there's a three hundred and fifty dollar prize pool. Um, the the prize will for the winning entry will be a, pl a planting for bees learning kit for the the student school, the um, applicant school. Um, a, a bespoke bee classroom online incursion run by Bee School by Beechworth Honey available to the school. Um, and the whole class and a special, the actual um, student will receive a special gift and a certificate. So drum roll, the winning entry for the primary school uh, photograph was this one uh, titled Buzzing Bottle Brush from Benjamin um, at the Cairo Christian School in Victoria. So comments from the judges, just brief, please. A great shot for a primary school uh, student. The bee's in just about the right position. It's in focus. The lighting's pretty good. So I'm happy with it. How about you, Michael? Yeah, exactly that. And on top of that, it gives you that feeling, the buzzing bottle brush. That's exactly what we see when we walk past bottle brushes, is bees buzzing <laughs> all over them. So I thought it really told a, a good story and really well done. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. So the next prize is... Um, an award for the secondary school winner and, again, a $350 prize pool. So the school uh, will also receive a Planting for Bees learning kit and a bespoke classroom online incursion from Bee School by Beach with Honey. Um, and in addition, the student who's submitted will receive a special gift and a certificate. <clears throat> and the winning entry is this one, Hoverfly at Rest by Miranda Howard, um, who's a homeschool student from New South Wales. Anna, do you want to kick off with a comment on this one? I love this photograph for the almost cheeky expression on the face of the hoverfly. You can see... It's like it's got a little smile on its face and the composition is beautiful too with the diagonal lines and that feeling like it almost is perhaps about to take off and like what Bruce was saying, there's a bit of room in the photograph for it to move in the direction that you think it will move and a really lovely image. Any other comments from Michael or Bruce? I'm very impressed with the composition. Exactly as uh, Anna said, that bee is in a pretty good position. And the diagonal gives it a bit of dynamism. Very good. I loved it. I think it would have done really well even in the open uh, competition. It was an excellent image. Well done. All right. The third, um, the third prize we're going to announce is now in the open section, <coughs> and this is a special mention. So the prize, the winner is going to receive a two hundred fifty dollars <coughs> and a certificate. And the winner is for the special mention. First special mention is this one. Uh, the title, Dianella Delight, by Matt Goodwin from New South Wales. I thought it was a lovely image. I I think it's great. Um, I just thought the cropping might have could be improved just a little bit, but otherwise I've got no... Oh, and the background, like, it would have been good if that background didn't cause the bee to merge in so much. But just having said that, it's still a very good image. Yeah, I, th I think we're at the picky stage. It's such a good image. It was just trying to define the difference between this image and, and the winning images, but absolutely can't fault that um, beautiful image. Agree. It was lovely. And the colours um, really shine with the blues beautiful and yellows, colors. the complementary colours. Thank you. Well done to Matt Goodwin. Uh, so the next one is in the second special mention. So again, another $250 prize with the certificate and that will be awarded to Dominic Deligny, uh, title Australian Native Bee from Queensland. Comments from the judges. Yeah, this one's right up my alley. Um, <laughs> extreme macro. I think it was absolutely nailed. Uh, the beautiful soft diffused lighting shows up the hairs on the body, the angular thorax, the pollen grains. Loved everything about this image. Um, you know, it, it was one of my favourites. The focus on the eye is just 
Perfect. And this is a tetragonular bee, Michael, isn't it? Is that right? Yeah, it's got the angular thorax at the top there. So you can see that angular um, thorax, whereas the Ostroplevia have the rounded thorax. So. All right. So well done to Dominic for that one. Beautiful picture. Uh, the next one is going to be the open, again, in the open class. This is the third prize. And third place will receive a $500 um, prize with a certificate. And the third place goes to Lee Brooks. So the title is Hibiscus Bound and Lee is from South Australia. Comments from our judges. This one was just so dynamic in that the bees in flight and you've got that anticipation of it getting into the flower and the composition was lovely and the background really highlighted the bee to the front of it were the main things that I really appreciated about this image. I love the diagonal composition as well. Yeah, ditto on the composition. The first thing that jumped out with all of us with this photo is you, you couldn't do anything better with the composition. It's spot on. It's telling a story, the bees on a mission to get back into the flower, all the pollen grains on it. Bees perfectly in focus, lit beautifully. It's, uh, it's a great image. Very, I'd be very proud of that. I would, I'd say too, one of the things I heard it, when you were judging all the photos, there were some really, really, really good photos. And in having to sort through them, I heard you say it's a really good photo, but really this is about pollinators it's not quite telling the pollination story where something like this covered in pollen is really telling the story of pollination and that relationship between the bee and the plant or the, or the pollinator and the plant. So uh, fantastic. Well done, Lee. So the next award. Now, this is the People's Choice Award. So this one wasn't judged by our three judges. This came from a selection um, of photographs that were used as our promotion and advertising to promote the pollen. Uh, the, the photo competition so it went out to the general public on social media and received lots of comments so the people's choice award receives a $750 and a certificate and the people's choice award goes to Cassie Appleton the title room for two and Cassie's from Queensland and so these two bees one of our bee experts we've got another tetragonula and a cuckoo bee Yep. Is that right, Michael, our expert, <laughs> our resident I'm expert? Not, I'm not sure which book it be, but, yeah, I think it was great. There was um, a couple of multiple bee shot images or a butterfly and, and and some other insect, and I think this one captured it well, that uh, multiple bees visiting the same flower. You see that quite often if you watch flowers closely, seeing tetragonula pulling on the feet of honeybees, trying to dislodge them, things like that. So multiple visitors to a flower, I think it, it sums up that story pretty well and nailed the focus on the on the tetragonula coming into the flower. It's good. I also quite like that pink flower up the top. It just seems to um, help the image for some reason. So we're getting to the, the pointy end now. <laughs> so the second place winner will receive $750 and a certificate, and the second place has been awarded to Phil Smith for an oriental broad-nosed weevil photograph, and Phil is from Northern Territory, which is incredible. Comments from the judges on our weevil photograph. Not your typical pollinator that you think of, is it? No, but they do the job. Um, absolutely nailed it. This was probably my number one for a long time in the competition, and I think we even played around or Bruce played around with you know, doing different crops with it, but it sort of detracted from it. it it's just really good the way it is, the, the way the background's blurred out, um, weevils in perfect focus. It, it almost draws you into the photo. Um, absolutely love this shot. I couldn't fault it at all. Yeah, I, I like it. I, I did make a mistake. I thought it was cropped slightly too close to the... Um... Weevil, and I possibly would have put it up very slightly and to the left very slightly, but the more I look at it, the more I like it. <laughs> which which talks to the subjectivity of this whole process of judging photographs. That's right. Um, what I loved about this one was the repetition of the geometry. So you've got the, the round eye, which is made up of all these little spherical um, segments, and then you've got the globular um, style 
which is perched on metapolysal segments. And then you've got this spherical frill of um, pollen on the stamens in the background. It just it was very pleasing to the eye, this image. Yeah, so well done, Phil, um, for your second place wing photograph. And so we come now to the final, the winning, the open winner. So the first place winner is going to receive a prize pool of $1,849 value, valued at that. So that's going to be made up of a check or a um, payment of $1,500. And Nissi it, um, has contributed a quick adjustment macro focusing rail, uh, which is valued at $349 and will we'll also provide a certificate. So the winning entry for the 2023 Australian Pollinator Week pol Pollinator Photographic Competition is Drone Fly in Gardenia Thunbergia from Paul Harrop in Queensland. Big round of applause and comments from our <laughs> comments from our judges. Yeah, I guess this one was set apart. Um from the others it was very difficult to pick a winner out of all of them but the way that they've uh, encompassed blackening the background here to pull the image out to draw your attention uh colors fantastic composition focus everything nailed beautiful shot and and i must say i'm very jealous of, of the prize as well well done <laughs> all the focus rail will be um, something you'll have a lot of fun with yeah now, the lighting is beautiful on that um shot too Mm. It just sort of grabs you. It's got a lot of impact. It is. And the limited colour palette, it's really black, white and yellow. And so it, um, it makes a, a real feature of the subject perched on the flower there. And there's no distraction visually in any other part of the photo. And the lovely yeah. little touch of the pollen on the um, petals at the yeah. lower part of the image. I think it's originality and composition is what probably uh, threw it over the line. But, um, yeah, it was very hard, very hard competition to judge. But, yeah, well done uh, on that poor sensational shot. And certainly you were right there, Anna, that little bit of pollen on the tip of those petals, it just works so well. Mm. So I think one of the things that was incredibly pleasing for me this year is to see that there was such a broader diversity of pollinators that were entered. Uh, in the first year, we had predominantly bees, uh, many honeybees and, and a number of native bees, but it was largely dominated by bees, whereas this year we really had some a, a brilliant cross-section of different pollinators, which is, of course, what Australian Pollinator Week is all about. So well done, everybody. Um, to all the winners, we will be in contact with you. We'll reach out to find out details of how we can get your prizes to you. Uh, so I look forward to being in contact in the next uh, few days. Um, again, I just give a short plug to the, the sponsors without which we wouldn't be able to run these competitions. So thanks to all of our sponsors. Um, and that brings our session to the to a close. Thank you to our judges and good night to everybody who's participated and sat through tonight um, and sent in entries. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Fiona. Good night, all. Good night.